Hi everyone and welcome to today's webinar, States and Modes with Charles Wasson. My name is Katie, I'm the Communications Manager here at Vitech Corporation and I will be your host during today's webinar uh, pre presented by our special guest. Uh, we're excited to talk with you uh, about all of the great things that Charles got has ready to share with you today. And uh, just a little bit about Charles. He's the president of Waston Strategics LLC and is a member of INCOSI and the American Society of Engineering Education, uh, the Project Management Institute, and the Institute of Electrical and Electronic Engineers. His firm, Wasson Strategics LLC, provides professional training courses, workshops, and consulting services in multidiscipline systems engineering technical project management, enterprise and organizational development, and team development. The firm's private clients include Fortune 100 and 500 organizations in the aerospace and defense, medical, energy, and transportation sectors. Charles's professional career experience spans over 40 years of leadership in leading systems engineering and development development organizations that include Lockheed Martin Corporation, Teledyne Brown Engineering, and the U.S. Army Missile and Research Development Command, SCI Systems, and others. As an internationally recognized author and instructor in system engineering and development, he is an invited guest speaker and panelist at professional meetings and symposium, and a commencement speaker. He also just recently uh, added the ESEP designation and is excited to share with you today. Before Charles gets started, I do have a few quick housekeeping items. We will be answering questions today at the end of the webinar. Please send your questions in as soon as you think of them through the question tab on your webinar control panel. Charles will answer as many questions as he can today, but if we do not get to your question, we will reach out to you after the webinar. Our webinar is being recorded today, so if you experience connection problems during the live presentation, a recording will be available with and two business days of the live version. The recording will be published to Vitex webinar archive located on our website. I will send out the link in the chat window. Now I will turn over the presentation to Charles. Welcome. Well, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for attending this afternoon's webinar, System Phases, Modes, and States Solutions to Controversial Issues. Uh, our webinar today will basically consist of an introduction. We'll talk about framing the controversial problem space, address some of the system uh, central issues, such as what's the difference between a mode and a state? Uh, do modes contain states or do states contain modes? Uh, should specifications explicitly specify modes and states requirements? Or should modes and states requirements be flowed down to lower level architectural elements? We'll conclude with a summary and Q&A. The first set of slides that we'll be presenting will move fairly quickly because our, we have time constraints that we're trying to meet. But uh, as part of the introduction, I don't know about your experiences, but mine throughout my career was this was perhaps a lot, one of the high, most highly contested issues uh, that I had to deal with. Specifically, it was one that was probably the least understood and poorly implemented among the system enduring concepts. Uh, it's certainly exemplified by an ounce of knowledge cliche that we've heard so many times. And often on many projects, uh, the end result is typically driven by dominant personalities who basically browbeat their colleagues into acceptance. And I had, most of the projects I have worked on, unfortunately, in the past and early in my career, consisted of identifying modes and states after the design was complete. And one of the key takeaways today is understanding the importance of that being completed up front. Now, as part of today's webinar objectives and takeaways, I'd like to be able to point out some definitions of key terms and their interrelationships. Now, what I have here today are my proposals that seem to have been well accepted by a lot of people. Doesn't mean they're perfect and would certainly appreciate your feedback. Also today, we'd like to promote awareness of when modes and states are defined, help you understand that there are key critical analytical bridging mechanism between specification requirements, system architecting and system design, and also recognition that uh, modes and states many times will unnecessarily constrain specification requirements. In 2006, I released a uh, system engineering text through John Wiley that had a chapter in there on phases, modes, and states. 
that uh, received a lot of uh, comments from people positively. And in 2011, I presented a paper at the NCOSI 2011 Symposium in Denver. And that brings us up to today. Um, I'm getting ready to release the second edition of the textbook, which will be a landmark text uh, scheduled to be released by Wiley in early 2015 that will expand even today's discussions much further in helping you understand uh, the issues of modes and states. But first, let's begin by framing the problem space. If you're like me, I used to spend a lot of time in meetings and people would go around and around blowing out terms such as storage, operating on, off, manual mode, automatic mode, taking off, and it was really confusing as to what everyone was communicating about. If you investigate most literature out there today, one of the things you'll find is a lot of conflicting ambiguities in the reference guidance. For example, you'll find a lot of dictionaries and other type references that basically use circular references in which states are used to define modes and modes are used to define states. So let's illustrate with a few examples. Uh, without going into the gory details of the right-hand column, the thing I'd like to point out is if you look at a lot of some of the current um, references that are out there, including my own, which was in the second row, observe that the word mode is defined using the term condition. And then if we do a survey of state definitions, so basically the same set of references, observe that the term condition shows up in there as well. So obviously you see the seeds for growing conf conflicts basically in people's understanding of things. Mill Standard 498, which was canceled in 1998, uh, provided a glowing distinction on conflict. For example, the lower red section there on, in red, the distinction between states and modes is arbitrary. A system may be described in terms of states only, modes only, states within modes, modes within states, and any other scheme that is useful. And having worked back in the early 1980s for a couple of years as a system engineering and technology assistance contractor uh, in support of the government and their review of other contractors, one of the frustrations was, was discontinuities in the types of information was coming back. And when you see guidance like this, it's easy to understand why there was a problem. Here's an example that's available on the web at this time. It says, the operating system can be in one of four states, executing in user mode, executing in system mode, and so forth. So here we are saying there are four states of the system in which two of the states are ended in the term mode. And so that brings us, what is really the statement of the problem we're trying to deal with here? And then my experience has been this. It's really the development of modes and states on projects is typically ad hoc, inefficient, ineffective, and mired in controversy. Now, as with any type of problem statement, I don't go into what the root causes are and so forth. We'll talk about that a little bit later. But the essence of it is, is and if through objective evidence is, is really project teams and team members become got mired in controversy many times due to misguided or inexperienced leadership, project engineers, lead system engineers, or others concerning how a system, product, or service is envisioned to be operationally deployed, operated, maintained, sustained, retired, or disposed. And the key point is that really the purpose is to be able to enable the user to command and control the system, its performance in each of those phases. So my experience has been the sources of the problem go back to engineering education because quite simply, obviously there's no system engineering education per se in many of these engineering programs, and especially from the standpoint that all disciplines at least take some form of system engineering methods course. Professional standards many times that govern the definition of modes and states are lacking. And then finally, within most people's enterprises, the organizational standard processes are, tip, are many times are not prepared by qualified prof professionals. So this brings us to a key question then. What is the difference between a mode or a state? There are some things I'd like to, like to bring to your attention first. First of all, one of the key tenets of system engineering is being able to identify 
what has to be accomplished that is outcomes from the user. We won't go into the front end of that, just focus on this one point. And those outcomes need to be characterized by performance-based objectives, levels of performance for each objective, and then for a given set of operating environment conditions. Once we understand that, then we need to decide how to implement those what's or outcomes. Now, a word of caution. Purely for presentation purposes today, the two points we have are to above are really a high-level distillation of two key talking points that are relevant to the presentation. And this is where I'd like to offer this caveat. Many systems engineers and engineers today, really through no fault of their own because of deficiencies in engineering education, translate these two points into let's take a quantum leap from requirements to a single point design for the solution, which is wrong. And the other point is my experience in going into some organizations and working, especially from an organizational development perspective, is many times the engineers in organizations perceive themselves to be performing system engineering. And in fact, what it really is, is a specified design test fix engineering paradigm coupled with another one from the 1960s and is not system engineering. So these factors uh, need to be considered when thinking about the two points above. Some precepts I'd like to make you aware of. First of all, understand that modes and states are labels humans apply to systems so we can facilitate our own thought processes for system command and control. Now, in general, systems has integrated levels of just physical mechanisms in some respects are clueless as to what modes and states labels the humans employ to communicate their design thought processes or simply to label operator control panels. And obviously, as artificial intelligence and other technologies continue to evolve, we're going to see changes in this area. So systems, when they're operating properly, are really mechanisms that just produce or exhibit behavioral responses, that is, time-dependent transfer functions for a given set of operator command and control, C2, stimuli, excitations, or cues from external sources, and based on a set of operating conditions and scenarios. So in, an, in a basic engineering form, basically what we have is a stimulus behavioral response transfer function. And it is that transfer function that manifests itself ultimately into the physical domain that modes and states help us uh, establish. Let's take some really quick examples. Uh, rather than jumping into some details of definitions that have some nuances, let's begin with some practical examples that form the basis then to get to the definitions. Take a simple example like your car. Suppose it had the user has a use case, they just simply want to safely park the car. Now that represents what or an outcome to be achieved and so we naturally label it park. And how is that accomplished? Well, we do it through a set of operator command and control inputs in the form of park, if you will, accelerator inputs, brakes, or whatever if they happen to be uh, there. And then finally, we re receive or achieve some level one range of motion in which the wheels are locked, uh, the car is stationary, steering direction set, and so forth. And it's that physical manifestation of the vehicle in its configuration at that time represents the state of the vehicle. So we have a mode, what's to be achieved in the form of park that is accomplished by a state which represents the physical configuration of the car. So we can do the same thing in the case of the neutral in which the user wants to be able to have move the vehicle with external forces, forward or reverse, and and they're able to do that through changing that configuration of the vehicle. Then if we have a situation in which the engine is running, the user has a use case and want to safely reverse travel direction, then obviously they just simply put in the reverse gearing and through other combinations of controls produce results that physically move the car backward. And so we can repeat this same exercise for basic things like drive, low two, and low one. Now, what's interesting about these last three becomes a distinguishing point 
when we get the modes and states. So let's go back and summarize briefly. We have a park mode that represents use case number one to safely place the car in a, a stationary position, a neutral mode so we can enable vehicle movement by external forces, uh, reverse direction so we can reverse tr the travel direction, and then notice this, the outcome is forward direction, but based on the operating environment and the slopes or the levelness of the terrain that the vehicle's moving over, we now have to start thinking about some distinctions. Uh, use cases so that move forward under C2, use case number four would say travel on level ground or roads, which is really a sub-mode. Use case five is climb moderate inclines, another sub-mode, and then use case six, which is climb steep inclines. One of the things that you're going to see unfold in the definition for um, mode is a mode is an abstracted label. So in this case, the forward mode is really a high level abstraction for lower level submodes that represent specific use cases that allow the operator to be able to accomplish that overall mode. So let's go then into what is a good definition for a mode. Well, most people tend to think of the bubble charts that we see here like this, in which we have a pre-mission, mission, post-mission post phases or others, and the bubbles representing modes, and we do transitions into and out of those modes. So I would, re I would, like, I would recommend a definition that goes something like this. A mode is an abstract label representing a user-selectable outcome that enables a set of use case based system capabilities to be configured in conjunction with organizational processes and procedures to command and control the system or product to achieve a set of mission objectives and levels of performance. Let me go back and point out some key points of this thing. First of all, observe in the first line, user selectable outcome. For example, when you get into your vehicle and you put the car into the various gears, those are user selectable outcomes that you as the operator want to be able to achieve. What this requires is though, is some form of design that requires capabilities that enable the car to physically be configured in certain gears to operate and then obviously as one operating on the roads and so forth or for a company you have to do this in compliance with their practices and procedures and all for the purpose of achieving a mission set of objectives and levels of performance. Now, as we see in the top part of the diagram, we won't go into it here, but basically each of these arrows represents triggering events that really serve as entry or exit criteria for transitioning into or out of modes. And as we saw in the previous chart, modes can be subdivided into submodes. Now, this leads to a key question, how do we differentiate this from a state? Well, from an engineered system perspective, that is, it's, it's the actual system that's being engineered to be produced for the commercial market or contracts or so forth. The state represents really an attribute representing the current physical configuration or performance-based condition of a system product or service. So obviously, when you put the car in a particular gear, represents a physical configuration in combination with controls such as the accelerator pedal, braking, steering wheel, and so forth. And then you may recall from the earlier literature survey in which condition was an operative term that was in there. Now, observe this says engineered system perspective. However, organizational systems employ these products, services, or systems as assets. And so from their perspective, they want to know what really the employment status is of the vehicle. So for example, if you happen to own a fleet of vehicles doing services work, you'd like to know that all the vehicles are up and running. So they have their own perspectives as to the state of vehicles and so forth. So this leads to a broader definition in which I would suggest that it represents the logistical employment status, availability, an engineering term representing the condition uh, and availability to conduct missions or the physical configuration as an organizational aspect, asset. Now, typically, uh, 
a vehicle may either be in storage, it may be in deployment, distribution, or so forth and all. That is from the higher level organizational perspective. So to summarize once again, we said that a mode is an abstract later label rather applied to a user selectable outcome that enables a set of use case based system capabilities gears as we shall say in, in the case of the car and other configuration items to be used along with organizational processes and procedures to command and control. Remember that was the operative term we said early on command, modes and states enable us to be able to command and control the service uh, system product to service to achieve those objectives we want to be able to get to and in, again triggering events serve as entry and exit criteria modes can have sub modes. So, in summary, a state definition is really a physical attribute used to characterize the current logistical employment, status, availability, or physical configuration of the system product or service at various levels such as subsystem assembly and so forth. Now this brings us to issue number two and that is do modes contain states or do states contain modes? And this again is probably one of the key highlights of the controversy that seems to go on because of the ambiguities that exist in our education knowledge and literature. Now if you recall when we started out we said that in my experiences people walk into conference rooms and various places and you see all types of words floating around. So if you were to capture all of these words and analytically distill them into a basic set of categories, we'll soon find out that the word state is rather generic. In fact, there are five states that we will be introducing. So let's think about this for a moment. Um, we have a user community which consists of system owners, users and end users, project managers and and as a frame of reference. And so what I find that many of these people, as stated earlier, refer to the current state of employment of an organizational aspect, asset in order to perform missions as simply what is the state of the system, system states as we'll call it. There's also those that need to know what is the state of mission readiness. In other words, is it configured, is it in flight, what is its current operational state? So we'll create another term referred to as operational states. But here's where a dividing line comes into place, and that comes in the engineering community. Engineers many times have a frame of reference that obviously is also established in the form of operational states having to do with the operating condition or status. Is it operational? Is it failed? Is it degraded? Or these types of descriptions of it. And those operational states are represent what has taken place with the physical architectural configuration. So we'll refer to those as just simply physical configuration states. In other words, in your vehicle, once you put the, the car in gear, the transmission or transactional shifts into a particular physical configuration state to be able to accomplish the outcome. But you have to think more than just simply physical configuration states. There are environmental conditions that have an impact on the various physical configuration states that we have to consider. And once those environmental states interactions occur with the physical system itself, in many cases produce dynamic states or really having to do with dynamic stress loading conditions. Those could be longer term, those could be short term and so forth. So for example if you happen to be driving down the road and obviously you hit a nail or you encounter a flat on the car, that can potentially be a very dynamic condition where the physical phys uh, physical state of the vehicle is in question and the operator has to be able to control that. So the point is when we talk about states we really need to think in terms of system states and operational states from the owners, users, and end users perspective but also from an engineering perspective having to do with the physical configuration, the operating environment states that we're in, and then also the dynamic states. So let's touch briefly on some of those. In terms of system states from a user's perspective, 
in general, observing the top of the chart, most systems that are deployed into the marketplace or contracts or so forth undergo some form of deployment and, and distribution. Obviously, there's some form of setup that occurs. They go into operation maintenance or sustainment, and they very well may be discarded or retired or disposed of at that point in time. But in between each one of those states, though, is a situation in which there may be feedback to the previous state. So, for example, if you happen to um, have a system where you set it up, you operate it and maintain it, then the next thing is tear it down, and then you may redeploy it. Or in any of these states, you may store it. So in terms of a definition for system states, uh, and it represents an attribute that indicates the logistical employment, availability, and condition of a logistical asset, asset. Okay, but what is the state from the user's perspective? Then once it's in operation the, and fielded, if you will, the key question then comes into what are its operational states? Well, an operational state indicates the operational readiness condition of a system product to service at a specific instant in time to conduct or continue a mission. So for example, operational avail availability is a key system engineering metric that is for in the form of requirement that we often use to ensure that whenever a system product or service is required to be to perform its mission, then it is available. And one of the interesting things about operational states is my experience has been they end with an ing suffix. So for example, a system in general is either operational, that is, is performing missions, which may be in standby, taking taking off, cruising, landing, or so forth, or it might be non-operational, it's undergoing maintenance, it's in storage, so forth. And then there can also be situations in which sites are being activated to be able to accommodate the deployment of a system. And uh, the site may either be activated, deactivated, and so forth. In terms of physical configuration states, it really represents an attribute that characterizes the physical arrangement or configuration of a system or product or services architecture that provides the essential, I've noticed this, essential use case capabilities required to support achievement of one or more performance-based mission objectives. And what's important here is a system architecture may include several subsystems, but a given use case may only employ one or two of those subsystems. So it really, what we have to be able to do and when we configure the system is ensure that the right set of capabilities are lashed together or arranged or configured so they will produce the achieve the outcome desired by the higher level mode. And so, for example, if we happen to have an aircraft, it might either be in, in a passenger seat configuration or cargo, uh, might be in a takeoff configuration, the flaps, the landing gear, rudder, things like this are set in a particular position. Or in the case of some systems that may represent the equipment configuration, whether it's electrical power, mechanical, security, software, hydraulics, any of these, as well as could be a test configuration when you're in system integration and test. This brings us to the other one, which is environmental states, because they have an impact on the overall physical configuration of the architecture itself that has to be accommodated. And obviously, as part of the specification process, we need to be able to bound that. And so the environmental states really represent three types of environments, whether it's the natural environment, the human system environment that system interacts with, or the induced, induced environment created by an interaction between the natural or human system environments, any of these that influence the system design. So for example, things like sea state one, sea state two, category three hurricane, volcanic eruptions, earthquake magnitudes, road traffic conditions, threat levels, tsunami levels, any of these types of things that become the basis to characterize the operating environment our systems are going to have to operate in. And then finally, we get to the last one, which is the dynamic or transitory states. And those represent a time-dependent rate of change, that is, whether it's attitude, motion, performance, and so forth, and stress-related loading conditions 
of a system or product relative to a frame of reference in prescribed operating environment uh, and conditions. These states are typically like operational states have an ING uh, suffix. If you recall, and probably one of the most notable uh, examples it may stand out in many people's minds from the Challenger disaster, is the condition in which the Challenger was transitioning uh, through the max dynamic pressure zone. And so this represents the type of conditions, for example, the space shuttle had to be able to accommodate as it went through its, uh, its launch uh, series. So in terms of dynamic stress loading, you know, this could come from uh, launching, rotating, accelerating, climbing, jumping, bouncing. Um, in a conversation I had with someone recently concerning a webinar, they indicated that they had too many people try to log on at one time and brought the system down. So these are types of conditions we need to think about from a system engineering perspective. So the question comes up, says, okay, we've got these things like system states, operational states, physical states, environmental states, dynamic states, and modes. What's the relationship across all of those? But well, if you recall from our car example, we indicated that modes were certainly the higher level outcomes that we want to achieve and that states in general, which might, is certainly comprised of physical system, operational, environmental states and so forth, particularly physical states, enable us to be able to accomplish those outcomes. So let's take a look at it from really a phases of operation perspective, the third element of the title of the webinar today. Specifically, if you look at just a typical life cycle of a system, uh, in general, uh, where it's mission oriented, and most of them are, there's generally a pre-mission phase, mission phase, and a post-mission phase. Uh, it could be preceded by a storage phase or other. So for example, um, if we happen to have some type of system where we need to be able to go out and monitor hurricanes, then obviously certain aspects of the system may be in storage until the mission comes along where you need to be able to monitor uh, the conditions in a hurricane. But each one of these phases of operation can be divided down further into sub-phases of operation. So for example, let's take an aircraft. In the mission phase, uh, examples of it has phases of flight which effectively are subphases and those might consist of takeoff, climb, cruise, descend, land, holding pattern, or so forth and, and there. Now a key distinction obviously when you do these types of diagrams you have to make a distinction as to when the mission officially begins, in other words, leaving the terminal gate and when it ends. So you have to do that. But when we think about each of these, obviously each type, whether it's the uh, phases of operation or subphases, have their own respective set of outcomes. Those outcomes are achieved by perform in shifting into various types of modes of operation and accomplishment of those modes based on the user's use cases require certain types of states, particularly physical configuration states, to be able to achieve that. So from this type of concept in which we list those vertically using basically one-to-many uh, aggregation type relationships, we can find that in answering the question, do modes contain states or do states contain modes, my perspective is that in fact that states do contain modes, in other words, the modes uh, integrate within higher level system states, particularly from the user organization's level zero system perspective, but also in the physical entity of the system that has the operator, its physical states, dynamic states, and so forth represent states that support higher level modes of operations. So even though the questions are, are stated as being mutually exclusive, the fact of the matter is both aspects from my perspective are true. So let's briefly summarize what uh, we've got here then. The challenge in as we see people in particular organizations implementing modes and states is this. Many times we make bold proclamations of performing system engineering which we're really either naively or erroneously perceive its implementation as follows. 
Unfortunately, we see universities do this, doing this a lot. There's a perspective that system engineering means writing specifications, developing a system entity's architecture and design, allocating the requirements, and ultimately obviously getting to the design of the entity. The problem is we see people taking this quantum leap of faith directly from specification requirements to an architecture, resulting in a point to solution, and that becomes the basis for the system design and many times it occurs in failure. What's missing from this process is something I write about in the textbook where to me there are four types of system architectures that have to be developed in parallel and incidentally we're not showing even to the left of the right specifications a huge amount of process that occurs back there. But basically there are really four types of architectures. There's a requirements architecture, operational, behavioral, and physical that have to be formulated as we go along and these are highly iterative. These are not waterfall stepped processes. So a word of caution, and this is where we see many of the people that do, do not do well in modes and states creating these types of scenarios. So a key point I'd like to make from the webinar today is this. Even though the user has operational needs and they're represented by user stories, use cases, and scenarios, subsequently specification requirements evolve in general, we can get architectural solutions evolve into system design, and then there's interactions between these. The reality is system phases, modes, and states really become an analytical decision-made aid framework that allows us to be able to think about the outcomes those specifications want to be able to achieve and also evolve an architecture that can in, in, uh, invoke specific sets of capabilities that allow us to achieve those modes those uh, modes, and then ultimately get into a system design solution. So we get to issue number three and that is this. Should specifications contain modes and states requirements? You know I see this happening a lot uh, and during my career many times we had to address this in specifications. The Air Force uh, Space and Missile Systems Center, for example, has a document out there, the SMC System Engineering Primer Handbook, in which they provide a um, an outline, 321, on performance characteristics, and within it is, in essence, uh, identifying the states by names. Underneath it is their modes, and then filling it out like that. Now, the ambiguity that exists here is, is the um, system state is that what's being referred to or an operational state? Uh, and if so, which one of those particular attributes uh, become a key part of it? And so my suggestion is this, based on my experience now, I've had people in presentations disagree with this and say that their customers demand that they write modes and states into these things and so forth. Remember from a system engineering perspective, if you develop a performance-based specification and you do not tell the developer how to develop the system, only there are uh, basically input controls that need to come into the system, there's expected out performance-based outcomes. From, from a new development perspective, I would suggest avoiding development of modes and states centric specification unless you, there's really a compelling need, contractual requirement, good, bad, or indifferent, and you need to thoroughly understand what you're doing and the problem or issue the user is trying to solve. One additional point about uh, this, I have also worked on internal specifications for systems that we were developing for demonstration purposes and things like that. And in those types of environments, you may be able to get by with such things, but by the same token, you want to avoid telling anyone how to specific develop it, okay? Now, here's what you have to be aware of. If you decide to develop a modes and states centric specification, you must document all of the performance requirements associated with a specific state or mode. You just can't willy-nilly say, well, I was thinking about this mode one day or state and I thought up a couple of requirements. You had better be prepared to list all of the requirements that are relevant. And remember, if a mode or state is required, system integration attest as well as QA, 
quality assurance have a need to know about all of the requirements documented in the specification of a service of basis for compliance verification, especially if you happen to be the customer or the user and you're trying to put something like this specification out. So keep in mind like any type of specification, if you specify modes and states in a specification, you may have inadvertently limited the scope of available candidate architectural design op options, including what might have been the optimal ar architecture for the system. So I would suggest for further reading, you might want to go to this SMC uh, system engineering primer that's available on the web. And uh, there's some additional things. Uh, there's a reference coming up at the end. Uh, a gentleman from Australia has another paper. I think he's presented it as well, too. This brings us finally to the fourth issue, is should specification modes and states requirements be flowed down to lower level components? And again, as I said in the previous one, my personal position is you should not mandate modes and states requirements, at least based on my own experience. For example, if you notice in the top of the diagram here, uh, what we had earlier is basically the time-dependent transfer function where you know someone's think it got to think about modes and states and there's a certain set of inputs they got to be able to put in there to achieve a set of behavioral response outputs that are also perhaps time dependent. When we create a system architecture, we break it down into and select a basic architecture. And what we're trying to do there is, is what is the combination set of capabilities that we need to be able to string together, if you will, to be able to accomplish that transfer function. And so we don't want to be able to limit the scope of what architectural possibilities might be out there. What we can do, though, is we go through our analysis of the system specification for the system of interest. We can, in parallel, begin formulating a system architecture and subsequently select the preferred architecture, and then we start allocating those requirements from the system performance specification down to those particular ar architectural elements, rather than trying to mandate modes and states. Additionally, let's suppose that subsystem B in the center there of the system architecture. Suppose you make a decision that you want to procure it from an external vendor or a commercial off-the-shelf type product available in the marketplace. Well, obviously, you're pretty much stuck with whatever the product is designed to build unless you pay the vendor a lot of money, money to modify it. So my suggestion overall in terms of flowing down these specification requirements to lower levels is just strictly leave it to leaf level requirements and not do that. So in summary, issue number one, the difference between a mode and a state, I pointed out the fact that a mode really is a label that we as humans use to help communicate among ourselves about a user selectable outcome to be achieved that allows us to architecturally bring together or configure a set of capabilities to be able to achieve those outcomes. In terms of a state definition, it's a physical attribute that, that's employed not only by the owners and users, but also by the engineering community, having to do with the logistical employment, status, availability, or physical configuration of the system. Then in issue number two, we said, do modes contain states or vice versa? And my recommendation is both statements are true based on the hierarchy that we presented earlier and shown in this diagram. And then issue number three having to do with specification of modes and states and specs. Again, I would suggest avoiding development of modes and states specifically in specifications. Perhaps it may be okay if they're, if you're doing a life cycle phases of operation, pre-mission, mission, post-mission post things that are operationally based, there's some operational requirements that need to be able to achieve. Um, but again, it depends on the particular application, customer, and a whole host of other things there too as well. And then finally, remember if you do specify modes and states, you may have inadvertently limited the scope of available candidate architectural design solutions. And then issue number four, flowing down modes and states requirements. Again, I would suggest, particularly from a performance specification point of view, 
where you don't want to limit the options available, I would just simply, as part of the system architecture evolution, through from conceptual design and so forth, is simply flow down the leaf level requirements. And in case you are not may not be familiar with this term leaf level, if you went into a specification and it was a, a hierarchical string of requirement, it's the lowest level requirement that is necessary and sufficient to be able to flow down to one of these, say, subsystems like we have in the figure here. So as I close out here and in summary, I'd like for you to think about an earlier comment that I made, which was this. Many organizations by customer contract mandate rush out after a system product or service design is complete and fill out documentation that says, well, what are the modes and states of the system? And they have to dream those things up. Hopefully, the takeaway from today's presentation is such that modes and states is something you have to think about in the very front end of the conceptual design of a system product or service. And it is based on an analytical, really analysis of user stories for those in agile development, use cases, scenarios, and things like that, that manifest themselves in the forms of capability-based requirements. And what is the arrangement of how does the user command and control the system to be able to accomplish those modal outcomes with a certain specific physical configuration of the system itself. So in summary, in the concluding remarks, remember we started out with a problem statement that said its development of modes and states is often ad hoc, inefficient, ineffective, and mired in controversy. I find a lot of weak project engineers and systems engineers today not as a fault of their own, but one probably more of education and sometimes the organizations they work in. Remember, if you're a project engineer or a lead systems engineer or even a systems engineer on a product team, your job is to exhibit leadership skills that builds a consensus of definitions not only within your team, but also uh, within the project and certainly with the customer. And so as part of that, your job is to make sure that these definitions are well communicated and understood by project personnel and functional management. That's another issue in itself. That the definitions are necessary and sufficient for system development to minimize inefficient and effective utilization, really, of limited project resources. Make sure that the definitions are not um, inefficient and effective. And, um, and certainly, they're not subject to misinterpretation. We tend to think requirements, specification requirements, adhere to those criteria, but modes and states do as well, too. Once you get agreement on those modes and states, it's really important to put them in some form of project glossary that's approved, baseline, and under configuration control, and then consistently apply that guidance throughout all of your project documentation. So in summary, uh, if you'd like to hear or read more about this, uh, this, this material will be expanded greatly and the release is due to be come out, coming out by John Wiley in uh, 2015, roughly in the February time frame. So uh, Katie, uh, I would like to open it up at this time uh, in case uh, there might be questions that may have arisen uh, in the limited time we may have available. Okay, uh, we do have some questions, so thank you so much for the presentation. I've got a question here from Jack. Uh, he's asking, does mode signify transfer function while state signifies one of the progress properties and, a, and safety properties that the system exhibits while executing the transfer function? There are actually, I think, several answers to that. Um, my personal experiences have been, and we didn't get into this in details today, modes re as abstractions represent uh, several use, one or more use cases. And those use cases, um, in effect, really represent a form of transfer function that has to be achieved. So, so a use case has a particular preconditions and so forth, a stimulus, um, a transfer function, if you will, to produce a particular outcome. Regarding states, uh, I would agree with his comment that, yes, uh, they represent uh, progress transitions, I think, um, 
Certainly we can see that in the form of cars when they're shifting gears, uh, fuel tanks. A, a question comes up many times is how many states does a fuel tank have? And the answer is infinite number. So in general, um, I would agree, but with a qualifying part there in which modes are really an abstraction of a set of accommodated use cases that themselves represent transfer functions. Okay. okay, thank you. Uh, let's see, I've got a question here from Scott. Uh, he mentions that he's a Nittany Lion, and then he asks, he says, David Harrell was the originator of the state diagram back in 1987. I've only had the view that there are only states and that they are hierarchical. The, uh, this approach seems to have been adopted in SysML and UML tools, MBS is MBSE issues aside. The transitions between states help us define the behavior or functionality between physical states. Environmental and dynamic states seems appropriate. Could you comment on using a states-only approach? Well, as I mentioned during the presentation, um, one of the challenges that we have is engineers too many times jump to a point solution and ignore a lot of the intervening analytical steps. Um, my response would be is, um, having been a double E from the hardware world, uh, we certainly functioned, I guess, if you will, in a state's kind of uh, environment, if you will. Uh, certainly through a stim uh, excitations, uh, stimuli cues, and so forth, uh, an electronic device to produce a result. So one could certainly say that that took place. What we didn't realize at the time when we were doing electronic designs like that, though, was is there were actually higher level modes, abstractions, if you will, that the system, the electronic device we were developing going into that the user was trying to achieve. So. I wouldn't say that it can't be done. I'm just saying from my personal experience and especially from a system engineering perspective, there is a reason why we go through a stepwise logical process of getting from a user's operational need to the physical manifestation of the system. And it's to avoid missteps uh, in particular because of outcomes the user wants to be able to achieve and that's what modes do. Okay. Okay, thank you. Uh, I've got another one here from Greg. Uh, he asks, what do you think of Dory's handling of stateful objects in his object process methodology? Well, you know, based on my own personal experiences, I've, I've dealt a little bit with it. I'm not a student of him, and I, I really wouldn't be in a position to comment on that. Um, my career has been focused really on, on system engineering and the project management aspects as not only that as project manager but a functional manager. So I, I really wouldn't be positioned to answer that. Um, perhaps someone online may be familiar with that work and may want to send you a, a note. Uh, maybe they can put them in touch with them. Okay, great. Uh, we do have another question. We've got a question from Eric. It said that you mentioned one of today's problems is a lack of standards for modes in the states. Uh, do you have a list of good existing standards or guides to work from? Not right offhand. Uh, and that was one of the motivations for the text in, uh, released in 2006 and the paper in 2011 and the one is forthcoming. Um, if you go into some of the limited DOD material, as I mentioned, the SMC, um, the, there are there are uh, references that do discuss modes and states, but my experience has been most people, including customers and others, tend to just push them aside as just, oh, well, when, when the system's done, go think about modes and states. So my answer to the question is, is I know of none. You know, that's not trying to be... Um, my own personal opinion, but frankly, I have not found any, and that was the reason why, particularly why I did the Nkosi paper, was to put forth my position of what I thought modes and states were, really for the technical community to come back with me and help validate that proposition as whether it was correct or not. During the last um, uh, three years or so, uh, I know the paper's been distributed throughout the world. 
Uh, one of the things I do when I distribute the paper, I ask people, please give me feedback you know, based on your own experiences. Uh, I haven't received any to date. That doesn't mean they didn't may not have had opinions about it, but that's the only thing I could offer at this time. Okay, thank you. Um, let's see, we've got time for one more question. Uh, this is another one from Jack. He asks, does the physical attribute of states indicate that computer code does not have states but may make the hardware change state? I would say yes, obviously so, because on the one hand, uh, the code that obviously is executing in there is translated by the hardware in a form of stimulus, and as a result, it could cause the hardware, the computer, if you originate, if you will, through command and control mechanisms to actually change state. So obviously, you know, where we have um, um, sometimes either fly-by-wire systems or things like that, which are highly complex systems, um, obviously the state would be changed based on a, a processing of a series of inputs that produce certain behavioral responses outcomes that, that cause the hardware to change state. So um, that would that's what I would suggest. Okay, and I said one more question, but I'm going to ask this one. Uh, so Eric would like to know if there's a place that that paper you presented can be seen online. Uh, not at this time. Uh, in COSI, uh, through their database, and you have to be a member to be able to access that, uh, the paper's available out there. The paper actually underwent um, a couple of revisions following the presentation in 2011. So if they would like to email me at uh, my email address, which is WSLSE, at cpws.net or just simply go to wassonstrategics.com and there's a form out there to just put in a request for the paper. Uh, I would be delighted to uh, send that to you. Uh, as I mentioned when we started out too, uh, the snapshot of that is based on 2011. Uh, what will be forthcoming in the new release of the textbook uh, will be well beyond that, uh, which was couldn't present today because of a variety of issues, legal issues out there. So, but anyway, just please just send me an email, and I'll be or go to the website and be happy to uh, communicate with you on that. Okay, sounds great. Let's see. All right. So thank you, everyone. And there were a couple of questions that came in at the last minute. I will get those over to Charles so that he can reach out to you separately to get those answered. Uh, if you have any other questions or comments that come up, please don't hesitate to shoot Charles an email. Uh, he did just give you guys his email address, and it's also on the screen. I would be happy to hear from you with any inquiries you may have. In addition, you can post your questions or comments on Vitech Corporation's LinkedIn group page, and we will be monitoring that um, and making sure that Charles sees anything that's specific to him or if there's anything that our systems engineers can help you with, they would be happy to do so. Thank you so much to everybody for coming today. We hope that you are as excited as we are about the next generation of systems engineers and systems concepts. Our next webinar will be a special customer exclusive webinar on requirements development and core and the link to register is on our website www.vitechcorp.com under the my support tab that you'll see in red at the top of the page. Uh, we do have just one more note. At the conclusion of this webinar, a survey will open on your screen. Please take a moment to give us feedback on today's presentation or on what topics you'd like to see covered in future webinars. That's all for today, and thank you for joining us.